Well, hello and welcome back to Elevate Ordinary. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi. And I'm Teresa Grodi. And we're back with another extraordinary conversation about the ordinary pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. It's going to be back with you today. Thanks for listening in. We're going to kind of build on a previous episode today. Today we're going to talk about stability. We were talking last time about uh, pendulums and being a person of passion and stepping off that train and kind of becoming more stable in terms of your person itself. Today we're talking about the stability of the family. The, the particular unique contribution, uh, one of the unique contributions of the family to the church and to society as a whole is this stability, this continuity over time. Uh, and you had a, a particularly intriguing question that you were sort of gonna kick us off this topic with, Teresa, why don't you, why don't you read it? And I haven't heard it yet, this is new, this is new to me, this question. Yeah, so um, this topic is really, really important to me. Mm. Really, really important to me. We spend a lot of time in our own personal lives, yeah. um, in our diocese and in our par- across several parishes, um, trying to develop a plan for stable families. We've always been working on community stuff, yeah. you know, um, building community, working with our families, trying to mm-hmm. kind of figure that that nut out in you know 2023. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know. And so we've been thinking about this for years. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so today I want to bring to you this question that I've been thinking a lot about. um, And I kind of want you to like, just let it ruminate as we're talking. Okay. Have you been contracepting the power of the generation that came before you? Hmm. Have you been contracepting the power or fertility of the generation that came before you. Hmm. Okay. We talked a little bit about this when we had the good money guys on Mark and uh, Jacob about the idea of giving our money, just the physical, the number of money, the number of monies that Catholics in the United States have Mm -hmm. that we give to fortune 500 companies through investments or whatever. And if we had given the same amount to our churches, like the number is staggering. It's just staggering. So it, 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 I, I started kind of thinking about this in terms of family, like what's family capital, hmm. you know, what, what, how am I kind of cutting off the power of past my own power? How am I cutting off my own power? Hmm. Okay. The power that is through the order that God has given me. Okay. So have you been contracepting the power of the generation that came before you? Um, In thinking about stability for our churches and stability for the diocese, I've kind of come to this conclusion, and I think the church has come to this conclusion too, but that stable, healthy clergy will ensure that the sacraments are dispensed faithfully. Okay, stable, healthy human priests. Okay, Um, and that stable and healthy families will ensure a multi-generational church who naturally has enough stability and generosity to take care of the widows and the orphans and the marginalized, okay? So we know that God's program for bringing new generations into this world is the family. Okay, the church has stated that again and again. Um, Family is always kind of the microcosm of the church and of the world. As the family goes, so goes the world. Yeah, you can't have a stable society without stable marriages and stable families, Mm -hmm. stable children. Mm -hmm. Um, And economists call this human capital, okay? Mm -hmm. So the family is in charge of human capital, you know, what your, how well your societies go. Um, And I wanna give two articles that I think are absolutely excellent for answering my question. Have you been contracepting the power of the generation that came before you? One is an article called The Economy for the Family, put out by the Pontifical Council for the Family um, in 1996. Um, It outlines the basic, you know, family is the basic living cell of society. So goes the family, so goes the nation, so goes the whole world. Um, And um, they emphasize that the choice is clear to nations, to states, to people. Um, They're speaking, you know, at the Vatican to the whole world. The choice is clear and urgent, either family-friendly policies or social collapse. You know, and I think of this even in, we can even think of this in our own parishes. Family-friendly policies or parish collapse. Diocese-wide, family-friendly um, living conditions, truly, or it's it's all going to collapse and you're, yeah. you're going to have to rebuild it. Um, the family... Uh, 
Family policy is thus not the a, a cause or an interest group or a political faction. It is it, like it is what keeps society from disintegrating right. and gives us any viable future. And the um, Pontifical Council calls that the family itself must be the first protagonist of this process. Yeah. And it says, it is not helpless. Okay. This is, this is what I think that the laity often, like the laity has seeded maybe in the last century, is that we feel helpless. Like father has to run everything. The parish has to run everything. I can't have Catholic friends unless somebody gives me a Bible study to go to. You know, like we, we've, we've just kind of just like sat here and have been like, I'm helpless. I'm a helpless Catholic. I wish I had things, but my parish isn't giving me things. So I guess I'm just not going to have things. Okay. And this, this council says, it's not, you're not helpless. First, the family must discover its nature, its rights, and its potential. Um, so we... We have to recognize that we have a lot to give. Um, we have a lot to give as single people, but then once you get married and begin having children, your ability to have power within your community and within your parish is, is like exponential. Hmm. Not only do you as a single person, then stepping into the role of your vocation where you become a servant of other people continuously. I mean, I'm a mom of six kids. I am continuously serving other people. We have a dog too, you know, but I, I ju it just becomes a habit to serve. Like I'm just, we're ready to jump in and serve anywhere we go. You know, the kids are ready to clean up and pick up like when we're at a parish event or something. Like it's just, you be, I mean, there's always grumbling. Okay, nothing's perfect. But it's like, you begin to build this culture and this habit of like, we just give, we give and we're servants, right? And when there's many, many servants, the stuff gets done right away. You know, it gets done quickly. Um, so we have this power, you know, as we, we have children and the children grow up and they become these powerhouses at your disposal, right? And, and I don't mean that in a utilitarian kind of way, like I'm using my children as slaves. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that this is the reality. Yeah, this, is, this is how... This is how things get done. This is how society moves and changes. It's it's funny sometimes in conversations, you know, private conversations or even you know, kind of the political conversation, the family is just seen as another demographic, like another mm -hmm. focus group, another identity group, as if like, oh, there's these kind of people, these kind of people, these kind of people, and then family people. You take care of the young adults and, <laughs> and the these, families and these and, and the families. migrants and the. <laughs> but that's just not how it works at all. The fam like everyone has come from a family. You know, family even if is, you still if you don't have your family, you still right. came even, from a family. Even in broken situations, everybody comes from from family life. So a family is always this primordial, this primordial place. But also, like last episode, we were talking about, you know, becoming people who uh, aren't you know just swayed by every new fad and movement and emotion. Um, well, that primarily happens in family life. Like that's mm -hmm. family is a, is a school for virtue. It's where you you come into the world. You're loved just for just for being there, not because people preferred you or they found you or you're you happen to get along really well. No, you just you're just loved and accepted because you're family, and it's also the place, as you were pointing out, like where you learn to set aside again, mere preference, mere mere passion, and and just and begin to make good choices to do the good because it's good. Uh, like you have to give up a lot in family life. You have to <laughs> learn to share. You have to learn to get along. You have to learn to take turns. You have to, there's all kinds of things that in, in family life, it just naturally happens. And so the health of the family and families across culture, that, that is going to be this, this, um, this bellwether for like where the society is going. How is the health of the family? Well, that's going to determine the, the course and direction of society. And, and then again, on a more practical level for us as Catholics, the church, right? The family is not an afterthought. It's not yet another group. It's, mm -hmm. it's the health of the whole body really comes down. It passes through family life. Yeah. So I have this written in my notes. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I'm not one of those people who can read notes and sound seamless. Well, so I'm just going to read people. my notes. Well, okay. Those people. Yeah. <laughs> Families are not a, not a niche interest group, niche interest group within the church, but families are God's primordial program for the continuation <laughs> and catechesis of his people and include all persons. 
uh, quote, the family as a fundamental and essential educating community community is the privileged means for transmitting of religious and cultural values, which help the person to acquire his or own, his or her own identity. The family contains in itself the very future of society. As the family goes, so goes the nation, so goes the whole world in which we live. Wow. Everyone comes from a family, regardless as if they feel like they belong in a family. In stable families, we learn how to care for the poor and the helpless. In the family, we learn how to sacrifice based on love, not on fear. In stable families, we learn that people are born and grow old and that neither the new life nor the aging are something to fear. In stable families, each member learns how to become, quote, the servant of the others, John Paul II. Hmm. In stable families, we learn that at the beginning of our lives and at the end of our lives, we need to be taken care of. And in the middle of our, our lives, we take care of, we take care of, okay? So in, in our good body stage, <laughs> we take care of, and that's a quote from Mark Barnes. In stable families, we learn that God is a God of abundance and not a God of scarcity. And this is important as to where mm -hmm. we're going for. So to recognize the potential of families, you move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. Mm. Okay. So right now I'm in a position with my kids where they're, most of them are very little, mm -hmm. but we've got a rising 12 year old and a rising 10 year old and a rising eight year old. And they're becoming very helpful mm. in a way that little tiny children are not. And so I'm beginning to move from a scarcity mindset where I'm taking care of like everything is an emergency and there's not enough of me to an abundance mindset where I need this help. Can you please get this for me? Oh, mm. it's trash day. Can you go t take the trash out? Like I'm moving from a place of desperate desperation need of having young children to a place of abundance. Like I can send someone over to the neighbor's house yeah. to help with their kids or their cat or their whatever. I can send someone to grandma um, for help. I can send a kid to the parish to help out with something. Like I'm now, I'm now in a position of abundance. Okay. Well, and that's something that's learned in a stable family and in a society built on stable families. Yeah. It, it, it reveals itself more and more. The scarcity abundance mindset is a, is a helpful thing. We hear it talked a lot about in culture. Um, and it's a, I think it's a fundamentally Christian thing, even though the people talk, who are talking about it aren't always necessarily religious or Christian, but it's a basic fundamental existential choice of whether you, whether you in faith believe and choose to act as if you live in a universe that's governed by a good and generous king. Right. The Christian, again, we have in scripture, you know, all things work, work for good for those who, um, those who love God. <laughs> <laughs> I have like five different translations of that, that verse <laughs> rattling around in my head and I always get them wrong. The point is, is that like, again, as Christians, we know God is in control. He's a, he's abundant. His grace is enough. All these reassurances from scripture that, um, we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about scarcity. We can do what is right and trust that God will bring the abundance. He'll bring the fruit. But that's a choice. Like we can we can believe it intellectually, but it's it's a it's a very definite choice. And in family life, like you you are constantly being faced up to that choice of whether I'm going to fall back into worry about scarcity and start grasping and taking what I can get and and worry about oh I need to uh, you know um, like compromise family life because I'm I'm worried about the direction of of the family and the in the world, or I and I'm going to I'm going to choose this abundance mindset. And I am really am going to just just dig in and love my family and develop that and trust that mm -hmm. God's going to be working with me and is going to bring it about. Um, family constantly challenges you with opportunities to <laughs> those two ways. Rather, mm -hmm. am I going to fall back into doubt and disbelief, uh, mistrust in God's providence, or am I going to trust in God's mm -hmm. providence and be present and invest in my family because I know that it's good in of itself? But also because this is this is my contribution to the world. This is my prime. Whatever else I'm doing, this is my primary contribution to the church and the world. Mm -hmm. Is my healthy, stable, holy family. Mm -hmm. That's the very best that I and we can give. Is this family? Yeah, and I think that sometimes not to go on a tangent. That's what we do, babe. Go on a tangent. Sometimes I think that when that's said, yeah, my primary objective is my family. Yes, it absolutely is. Like I vowed that, mm -hmm. like we vowed that. That's not just mama's taking care of the house kind of thing, you know, or barefoot in the kitchen. Okay. When my family is the healthiest, mm -hmm. 
that looks different for every marriage because it looks different for every person, you know? Um, and so that doesn't just look like one thing. It right. doesn't look like one set of clothing. It doesn't look like one schedule. It doesn't look like, you know, one cleaning routine. It doesn't look like, uh, like you're choosing one particular means for, yeah. you know, something like and, you being yeah. healthy and holy and fulfilled in your marriage can look very different for many people. And right. Is, Just like yeah. some people need time alone to recharge and then other people need to go and like be raging with a bunch of other people and excited and talking right. to be recharged. Um, so it looks different. So don't don't take that as like. Well, and this like, is why the stability of the family, it, it consists in the family's messiness. Right, and mm -hmm. its adaptability, and the fact that it looks different. Because that's the you know, school. The mess is the school. It adapts to the person, right? Like every family is able to, to, by God's grace, to love those particular individuals who are weird and unique amongst the whole sea of other individuals in existence. You know, it's in the it's in the family, right? The the community of the family that, you know, the the people of God are able to to adapt to the times and circumstances that they're given. And do good amidst that, right? That that's this this uh, <laughs> this institution of the family is able. We we're able to meet whatever challenge of our particular day and age and season in the church. Um, and so there's there's a messiness to family life and the adaptability of movement. Um, but it's able to, again, by God's grace, just as 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 individuals are, it's able to become what is needed for. Um, this particular time, you know, the particular work that God has given the church today. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. So, I'm not talking cookie cutter. We're not talking cookie cutter. We're not, ta yeah, not yeah, talking. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's the church. The church is full of mysteries, right? And I think all heresies are trying to make it black and white. Mm -hmm. You know, the 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 reality of the fact that truth is not relative. Mm -hmm. Reality is not. You can't be. Well, okay, truth is not relative. It's not changing. Yeah. But yeah. each, every single person is unique, mm -hmm. which means that it is relative. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like truth isn't relative, but each person's journey to heaven mm -hmm. and each person's marriage, each the when, right. when you vow and you become married, that's a different journey. Yeah. You know, so, but, and, and the heresy is when you try to fit it in one or the other. This is what your marriage and family needs to look like. Well, the church doesn't tell us what to wear and how to educate our children. It doesn't. That was mm -hmm. our last episode. It tells us to be prudent, just, courageous, and temperate. Yeah. And then yeah. it sends us out to to instantiate the gospel, to bring about, to do those goods in our particular marriage, our particular family, our particular community, our particular country, etc. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this, this is a good setup mm -hmm. for the next intense article I'm going to suggest. Um, I'm going to finish reading my, my own thoughts, okay. and then we'll get to the article. Um, in stable families, we gently uncover God's plan for our life, our vocation. In families, priests and religious are formed. The silent informing of this truth becomes the foundation upon all which formal catechetical education relies upon. In stable families, we learn that our bodies are complementary as male and female and thus life-giving. In stable families, we learn that our bodies are precious and reverenced. I mean, I'm just thinking about like when you have a fat, chubby baby and like everybody just wants to kiss every part of that baby. Like we're kissing knuckles, pinching, fat pinching, knuckles, pinching, and we're pinching, pinching and we're pinching. hugging and we're kissing. And, yeah. and I mean, like it, the baby is like the reverencing of the human body and, mm. and our kids see that. Our kids see that all the time, yeah. you know. Stable families are better, better able to resist cohesively the idolatry of the world. Stable families produce the foundation upon which all formal church evangelization, vocation, catechetics, charitable work, and finances are built. Hmm. Stable families provide the good workers to care for the poor, widows, orphans, aging, and marginalized. Stable families provide a comfort and a strength for our priests and religious. Stable families make our church and our local communities potent, powerful, and fertile, okay? So now we're getting to this next article, and after I say my thing again, have you <clears throat> been contracepting the power of the generation that came before you? Okay, sticking it out, 
an awesome article by Mark Barnes over at New Polity mm -hmm. talking about cursing. It is bad to curse children. It is bad to curse your children. I object. No, I'm just kidding. St. Thomas Aquinas says, a curse is when a man commands or desires another's evil as evil. Oof. Okay. So keep that in mind. When a man commands or desires another evil as evil. The beginning part of this article talks about how we're always telling children, you're going to do great out there, kid. Hmm. You're going to go far. You're going to get out of this town the same time we're cursing where we live and the soil mm -hmm. upon which, you know, we've all been there. We've all hated this town and wanted to get out of here. Okay. And that this, this is bigger than just the town we live in. Hmm. Okay. This is a bigger thing because you're cursing the child's potency. For it is precisely the child, mm -hmm. after much agony, embarrassment, and frustration from the whole community, when the child actually becomes useful, that he is begged by a song and a script to go far. If children are arrows in quivered, they are unwieldy arrows for about a decade and a half. Modernity ensures that a man cares for them while they are useless and then casts them away at the moment they can be aimed at the killing of anything of real importance. This is, this is a contraceptive that acts after contraception in that it prevents not the existence of the child, but the existence of the useful child. Okay. Now think about that in terms of the family hmm. of your parish and your city. You work so hard to bring that child up, to sacrifice for that child, to catechize that child, to help them grow in virtue, to educate them, even, you know, even if you're not doing it in your home and you're, you know, you are still educating your child and bringing up your child for 18 years. And then you send them away mm -hmm. from your community. Yeah, there's a whole mythos in your parish, in our language, in our children's cartoons, in our children's books, and in, in our school system of just this mythos of yeah, once I get out of this this town, you know, this this family, this stuffy community, I get out there in the real world. I and mean, we do this in the church too. Like, you know, out there somewhere is the, where the important stuff is happening, where the the real intrigue, the real drama is happening in the church and in society. And you have to get out there and do stuff. But again, that that ends up being this curse, right? Because we're always we're always deferring virtue. We're always saying, well, yeah, when I get out there, I can finally get out there and do the good some mission that God's calling me to when no, the mission might be just here. And now mm -hmm. this family, this town, this parish, that's where you can have the, 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 the real power mm -hmm. as an individual to. Well, and the, yeah. the power doesn't come immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the power reveal, the article says like the power reveals itself, the power of a place, mm -hmm. its usefulness reveals itself over time. And only like, you know, like when somebody is a farmer and they know their land, they don't know it the first year they have it. They know it after several seasons and watching things change and watching, you know, like they, be, they begin to know their land. And it's only after you've known your land that like it makes, like you become an expert in it, right? And similarly, like you, you watch the trends of your parish, you watch the trends of your locality, you watch the trends of your diocese, over decades and you start to become someone who can have, who can affect great power. You know, um, the article says for one of the obvious effects of remaining, sticking it out and living here rather than there is that one becomes much more powerful. One develops greater capacities for action. One can do more. You can't do a ton when you're always uprooting yourself and trying to like, is this where I'm going to stay forever? Is this the house? I'm, how long am I going to be in this house? Am I only going to be in this house three years? Mm -hmm. You know, like I shouldn't hang any paintings or make any holes in the wall. Like that's, that is a impotent mindset to look at your land, to look at your children, to look at your parish, to look at your diocese as something you may not be in forever. And you know, God can call people to move. Okay. So we're talking about, ex we're not talking about extraordinary yeah, situations. That's, that's we're talking about the ordinary. What does the family do? Actually, Rerum Navarum talks about why the land becomes a person's. Hmm. 
why private property is real. And it has to do with the fact that that property sustains that family or that person. The man uses that property to sustain himself and his family, and thus the land becomes his private property. So, well, yeah. Okay. I just want to finish up. Hmm. Nope, I lost the train. You well, go for it. So I'm just thinking, so this is I mean, part of what we're, so we're talking about this episode is that family exerts this stabilizing and, and growing in potency to the church and to culture if the family is, is stable. Uh, and again, one of these primary ways that we, we um, make the family impotent is we have, a, again, a, a whole culture, a whole society, a, a whole mythos around getting out of this town, getting out of this family, and going out there to do something important in your life when really the real power of, of family is it, how it, it plants itself and it grows and it becomes something bigger. I mean, that's where a town comes from. That's where a country comes from is because the family stays and it grows and it blossoms and there are generations and there are traditions and there are, you know, there are structures that. Now you also can't have any of that. Hmm. Like we, we say, we want a Catholic culture. We want a Catholic culture. We want a truly Catholic culture. Okay. But we are actively doing things that are cutting that off at the knees. Okay. And the number one thing we're doing and, and think about this for a little while. Okay. We are idolizing the youth. Okay, we are chasing the youth. Oh, I if that. you can't look at the generation before you and say they have dignity, okay, the people with the guitar masses have dignity, okay? The people who are into the guitar masses and into the band masses, they have dignity. They came before me and they have been married for 20, 30 years, they've produced adult kids. They've lived a life and that is valuable to me. I am under them, okay? Because guess what? If, if you're a youth now, okay? <laughs> whatever that means, whatever age range that means. If you're a youth now, you're going to be old, okay? And the option is either being powerful for God in what age you're at, whatever age you're in or chasing the next pendulum, which is what we talked about in our last episode. Huh. Yeah. Okay, the youths liked the guitar mass in the 70s. Then the youths liked the band mass in the 90s. Now the youths are into the TLM, okay? And guess what the next one coming up is? The Byzantine rite. I can already see it coming. And, and I, my parents belong to a Byzantine rite. Like, this isn't against the TLM or the Byzantine rite. I'm just saying, like, if we're continuously saying, what's attracting the youth? And we're never saying to ourselves, what makes multi-generational saints? then we are chasing something that is, it is castrating us. It's making us not, it's making the church not have power in these families that we're creating, these families that we're fighting for in a culture that is so opposed to families. We're saying, you part your hair to the side, you part your hair to the middle. You, like, we're, we're, we're building generational blocks between us. Well, that is, like it's, you can't have multi generational yeah. power without reverencing the people who came. Well, it seems like you. this is a fundamental uh, temptation of the devil: is always to divide the generations, right? Mm -hmm. Is to get, is to have reasons for the, you know, the the old to look down on and dismiss mm -hmm. the youth, and for the youth to to look down on and dismiss yeah. the old, uh, and and both are part of the church. Both are part of the family life of the church. And there's only the only way that it, it grows and builds and blossoms is if there's this continuity and mutual respect. You know, the youth. Well, the zealousness of the youth yeah, has its place in yeah. society. Yeah. It, it is power. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about. It is power. Mm -hmm. But it comes within an entire life. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the zealousness of the youth, the freedom, I, did we talk about in this episode or the episode before, where like, we were so free as college students to binge all the sacraments. And then when we got married, we had to be like, oh, I literally don't have gas money to drive to church every day for daily mass. So we have to pick one day and I have to make my home a domestic church. You know what I mean? Like, mm. like you have, you're not free into, anymore. Yeah, you know, and 
your life looks different when you have grown kids mm -hmm. than when you're in the thick of like the emergency years <laughs> of kids, you know? You, you mentioned earlier idolizing the youth. That's an interesting thought because I feel like we always do see this in, par in, in our parish life, right? Where we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we fix this thing? How do we get this thing moving? And we're, and we're all in our various parishes trying to figure that out. But it's like, it always seems like the first thing to, to happen is, oh, we're going to hire a, a youth minister, a youth a youth person, youth group. Get the youth I think group you should have a young person leading the youth group. I'm not saying you should. Well, shouldn't. but I think <laughs> sometimes I think we turn to that too quickly as if that's going to solve the parish. And it, it's an idolization of the youth. I think that that's problematic because, again, the youth don't create the stability of that parish. Mm -hmm. It's the families. And so you you can get youth really excited and you can have a great youth group. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But even if you do, that doesn't trickle back to changing the family. You, the families are what create the stability and the healthy, uh, mm -hmm. holy youth over time. So if that, again, if that zeal of the youth is to be you know, encouraged and formed and utilized, you, you have to get to the family. Mm -hmm. The family is where it comes about, where it's formed and where it's perpetuated and, and funneled into the right, you know, into the right virtuous yeah. ways. Kimberly Hahn has this beautiful program in Steubenville where she takes young families and then the college students at um, Franciscan University, uh, girls, and pairs them together mm. with kind of like a mother's helper. Mm. Um, the, the girl acts like a mother's helper. And then the family provides one day a week, like a home cooked meal and the use of the washing machine, mm. washing machine and dryer. Um, and it, it serves such a purpose to unite these two generations, right? But it also is Kimberly in her wisdom of having grown up children and being like, this is what, this is the connection that these people need in these two generations that I've lived through. I was young college student once and I was a young mother once and I had a ton of time and I was lonely as a college student. I mean, I, I guess I'm putting words in her mouth there, but I'm just thinking through the scenario. And I felt like I was drowning in the young mother age. So why don't we put these two together? Hmm. You know, and she did that in her wisdom. It's not just because she's Kimberly, Kimberly Hahn. It's because she lived those stages. And now in her wisdom, she's able to facilitate that, you know. And that's power. Yeah. That's potency. Okay. So are we, by... by being aware of like what is cringe right now, you know, being aware of what are, what are boomers, but which by the way, no one ever mentions Generation X, Gen X, sorry, Gen X, that's me. Okay, boomers have their problems, <laughs> millennials have their problems, but no one ever mentions Gen X. It's like we're out there being adults or something. Anyway, never mind. It's the generation that everybody forgets. Um, <laughs> but it, wait, where was I going I with that no ridiculous <laughs> tirade? <laughs> Oh. The power, preserving the power of the family, you know. Well, yeah. So, like, are yeah. we are we acting in this way? Are we believing that the experience of people whose culture we don't understand, you know, forty years our senior, mm -hmm. is old and stupid, and we and, and and I'm right now like I'm right in the middle of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not technically a youth anymore. Okay, and I'm not someone who's raised her children yet, right? So I'm in the middle of this and I'm remembering how I thought the older generation was stupid. And now I'm like watching my kids be, you know, like nearly adults. And I'm just like, oh, I behaved like that. And I was just insufferable to adults, you know? So you're like, you're like in this middle. Yeah. And what I really, really don't want is I really don't, I, I would like to stop this generational factioning. Mm -hmm. Because we, we just don't have power that way. And again, it strikes me going back to the beginning here. It's like the family is where that happens. It doesn't primarily happen in the parish or in politics or in media or culture. It happens in the family is where you hold these two things together. Old, you know, age mm -hmm. and wisdom and, and youth and, and vigor. And vigor, yeah. Those, those come together. And that's where the fruit of, the, of that dynamic mm -hmm. is produced. And when you lose the family, I think you also – when you lose, lose stable families – you lose that place in in society where that dynamic happens, mm -hmm. and it's it's interesting to think of, you know, is, is it the case? I've heard it said. I don't, you know, it bears a longer conversation. But is the 
are the divide, the larger divides in our society, the, the polarizations in our society and in the church between like liberal minded people, conservative minded people, is it, is it really come down to, you know, that, uh, that factioning between the generations again, mm. age and wisdom and youth and zeal is, is something about the society when we've let those things fall apart, we end up with these, these warring factions in society when really maybe it comes down to in family life, you have both, you have youth and creativity and changing to, uh, you know, to adapt to the times, but you also have the stability, carrying on the wisdom, respecting what's come before you. Mm -hmm. And is it in the family where that gets, that gets wed mm -hmm. together? That gets... And also realizing what actually doesn't matter. Let me attempt to summarize yeah. and fill in some blanks here. We can cut that out. I mean, the big... <laughs> Or not. I mean, the basic thing, just just for continued thought and reflection and discussion, you know, all of us in our in our families, in our in our marriages, and amongst our friends, is just like, are we taking seriously what again the church teaches about the family? Uh, what we know about the family that it is this primordial institution. It's where new new human life comes into the world, but it's also it's where people are primarily formed and loved and empowered. And it is, it's, it's really, you know, individuals in the context of the family that the stability of the ch the parish and the church and of society, it really all kind of rests on there. And so are we, I mean, we can say that we can, like, we can read that off, be like, oh, that sounds really great. We all believe that as mm -hmm. Catholics. Yeah. But are we doing in practically in terms of our money and our time, our schooling, our activities, you know, how we're building the family, not just right now, but intergenerationally, how, how we're thinking about our par parents, how we're forming our kids to think about mm -hmm. the generations of their family and the community and the stability. Are we in in a few or perhaps in many ways, as you said, contracepting the, the power of the generations that have come before us? Are we not allowing those to take root and build and grow forward? Because while we give lip service to these ideas of the importance of the family, the power of the family, are we living is if it's not true. We're living just the way the rest of the world is. We're living in, in ways that are informed, so many practical ways that are just informed by the culture rather than, again, stepping out in faith and really taking this seriously. This this family, this is how God brings new saints into the world and how he renews his church is through holy families. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, hmm. a very wise priest said to me the other day, um, don't give an older generation don't seed so readily your ability to teach. And I, it took me a few days to think about whether or not I thought this was applicable. Um, but actually, like I do, like we were so ready to like encourage within the church, like the, the young people, because we, we're, we know how quickly you can fall away. You know how quickly it is, you know? And so you don't want to like say something wrong, but at the same time, if I only ever hear, like, you're just so much better than I was at that age. You're just so much fun. Like, I really begin to believe it. Like, I have people, I've had people tell me since I was in college how amazing of a Catholic I am, you know? And so putting it into perspective, like, I don't have any way of knowing that. So putting it into perspective, like, I'm just a super awesome, great Catholic forever and ever and ever. And I know more, way more than all the other dumb generations who didn't have liturgical whatever, you know? And then like, I mean, look at me, like, I'm so ready to give my opinion all the time, you know? Like, <laughs> maybe Lady Catherine had a point, yeah. okay? It is interesting to think about, <laughs> yeah, the, the idolization of the youth that occurs on a cultural level and then the ways that we just slip into that same thing as a church. And it doesn't mean you have to be a jerk, no. right? But don't so readily cede your ability to give your wisdom. Well, it ends up, again, it, it ends up, so the, the error can go both ways. I mean, we as the relatively youthful of the church, the you know, else? we can fail to honor what's come before us and build on it and build on the stability and stay rooted and, and grow in the, in the family life. But so too, again, like when we, when we dismiss the youth or when we overly idolize and, and not form the youth, we end up, you know, disempowering them too, because I think, I mean, we look in the society today, we have a whole generation, uh, a young generation now of youth, youths in the world that, you know, that 
are very disempowered because they've not been formed in virtue. They've not been vor- formed in self-control. They've not been formed in useful skills. They've not been formed in families that have taught them that stability, you know, and that vision, you know, for, for kind of the, the normal vocation of, of human life. And so they're just kind of wandering. They're just kind of scattered and they're, they're at the mercy of the forces of the world that, you know, want to sell them things and want to use them for their causes. Mm-hmm. And so like th- this, this goes both ways, the, the young and the old in the church, there, there has to be, and again, the point, the, the whole original point of the episode is the family, that's really where it happens. That's one, that's another reason why just the, the family absolutely is crucial is because that's the place where these are brought together, where the, 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 the old form the young and care for them. And then they too, then have to rely on them and depend on them, you know, uh, to be cared by them and to harness, you know, their, their, their zeal and their creativity to build up the family, to build up the community. The family is where it happens, where that happens. That's where it's supposed to happen. So, well, I guess we better leave that. Before thanks, Teresa says anything else. Thanks for listening into that conversation about uh, family life and stability. We'd love to know what you the think there. The importance of stability. These are always a little bit messy because, again, we're not here teaching some uh, some stable, definitive conclusions. You know, we're, we're always thinking through this stuff ourselves. We're figuring out family life. We're working on virtue and we're making lots of mistakes. I'm just sharing a few of them <laughs> with you along the way. So uh, thanks for being along for the ride. Appreciate it. We'll be back again next time to talk uh, more about the, these sorts of topics. But in the meantime, if you go to elevateordinary.com, you can check out the archives and information about the show. And again, we'd love to love to hear from you and what's going on in your family life, your journey uh, in elevating the ordinary. So God bless. Talk to you again soon.